welcome to your digital mentor podcast. This is your sometimes host, Dr. Christine Boynette. As we begin to wrap up our second season, I'd like to thank all our listeners for sticking with us and spreading the word about the podcast. We really appreciate the support you've given us both in season one and two. When we began the podcast, our aim was to interview international members of the life sciences community and beyond on topical issues that face us today as scientists, but more importantly, as people. The idea was to create a space for mentorship-like experience that will hopefully be sustainable and will forever remain in the digital space for people to refer back to. You can listen to more about how the podcast came to be in one of our bonus episodes from season one. This is a special episode to showcase the winners from the TDR Mentorship Contest held in 2019 that I had the privilege of sharing the digital stage with. The idea behind it was to bring a global community together through a digital medium to give us a sense of locality through common experiences. This was, of course, before the pandemic, which, as you know, expedited the need for technology to bring communities together. I've never actually met any of them in person, but they all have such innovative ideas on increasing mentorship in different regions across the globe. We've invited them here today to share these programs with our amazing listeners. Who knows, maybe you'll even get inspired to start your own mentorship challenge or apply to the next TDR Mentorship Contest cohort. Here's Ella with the 2019 TDR Mentorship Contest winners. Welcome to your Digital Mentor Podcast. I'm your host, Emmanuel Opong, coming to you from Manchester City. In this episode, we'll be connecting with Dr. Ezra Valido, one of the winners of the 2019 Mentorship Contest led by TDR Sesh on how to improve research mentorship in low and middle income countries. Some of the challenges that scientists and researchers face in low and middle income countries include disparities in accessing or training opportunities, power hierarchies in academics, and challenges associated with guidelines for implementation and evaluation on different projects. In this case, it could also be mentorship. So we have with us Dr. Ezra Balido. He's both a biologist and a doctor of medicine from the University of the Philippines. He also holds a master's degree in public management and public health and is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Lucerne and Swiss paraplegic research. He is broadly interested in infectious diseases and designing, scaling, and implementing public health programs related to them, focusing on health systems and development, and in public health, focusing on tropical medicine. He also worked previously as a primary care physician and was employed in the medical affairs unit of Sanofi and Novo Nordisk in the Philippines affiliate handling endocrine, cardiovascular, and renal therapeutic areas. So welcome, Ezra. Hi. Yeah, so that's basically the summary of what I do from before. And actually, I'm very much interested in infectious disease, and that's what I do as well here in Switzerland, in, the, in Lutzen, and in the Swiss paraplegic research. And I do molecular identification of these infections that happens to spinal cord injured individuals. But I really like public health design, and that's why I joined actually the TDR contest, because I wanted to design a project or a program that really encapsulates in helping those who live in lower middle income countries to better uptake um, science and how to publish the scientific researches that they do. Because I believe sometimes they don't even think that what they do is worth publishing and it is. That's why you have lack of um, researches coming from these countries and our perspective actually as individuals or researchers coming from these countries are not being heard of and that's why why we build the project that I submitted for DDR SESH. Yeah, so I know you have different actors you are trying to sort of bring together. For example, in country practice groups, community practitioners and experts and publishing in terms of the lack of representation of published work and also some of the barriers they've faced. So transitioning from your introduction, first maybe tell us your motivation for initiating this project and what you've done so far from when you submitted your proposal to now. Basically, the motivation was more personal. When I came back from doing my master's in Indonesia, I didn't have the support system, the funding, and whom to go to to actually do research. So what I did was I also contacted friends who already did train actually in Europe that time and came back as well. And we had that the same experience. So what I did was to look at what we have as a resource in the Philippines and what is currently being done in terms of researches. And one of the key things 
experience that I found out was it was more practical to work with NGOs than go more academic because when you go more academic, they become more institutionalized, structured. So you need to follow what they actually have at the moment. But the thing is, coming from the outside on a more practical terms, because you need to earn money. That's a key problem when you are in a lower middle income country. There are no positions for scientists. There are no positions for researchers. What you have to do is go and look for opportunities for government agencies or non-government agencies needing research work. They usually are packaged as a say, a small fund and then you have a research to do. When we located that as an opportunity, so we went to a non-government organization. And because it was aligned to them that they, they also wanted to train individual researchers, so they were the first priority that we wanted to do the project with. And then at the time as well, I was part of a society of Philippine public health physicians. So it was a pool of experts already in the field. But I wanted to also put it at twist because I was advocating for implementation science uptake during the time in 2018-2020. What we did was we made it as a like an advocacy team technically to teach implementation science because nobody was doing it on the field, connected with an NGO for the management, for the support grants that we might get, and then connected to the society so that we have a ready expert to help us. So what we did in the first time was a small community of practice. We tried to build it in social media and we used Facebook. The notorious Facebook messenger in the Philippines is being used by everybody. That's the first platform that we did it. It was mostly close contacts from my own social network that I actually have to do it with. So that's usually how you begin things. People were interested in learning and then COVID happened. And COVID has a lot of things that we don't know yet for implementation, like what will happen to primary care during that COVID pandemic. So we did a series of workshops to build our proposal. And then we send it for funding to the National Department of Science and Technology, which specifically focuses also on health during that time. Luckily for us, we got the funding, but it took so long. So this is a learning process, I guess, for the first iteration of the project was we the proposal, we sent it for funding. It took so long to get that fund. Everybody moved on. So <laughs> at that time, everybody was doing ev- something else already. And then they informed us that we got the fund. And unfortunately, at that time, people cannot commit anymore to do the project. So what we did the next time around was to be more structured. So the grow to, as I call it, so because the project was called Getting Research to Work for Researchers. So the grow to iteration, it was more of a partnership with the society and the TDR Asia. So we really wanted to put more like we need to create a platform in Moodle where we place the lectures. It becomes more modular, structured. It becomes proposal driven by the participants. And then it would be funded if they want it. So it's a project by the participants, not like last time that it was uh, had a project, had a project in mind that you might want to join in and learn the process. This time, the iteration number two was we were going to teach you what IR is and you're going to create a project or you think you could submit for a proposal. When you're going to teach them implementation science, we will uh, help them, mentor them in creating a proposal. And from the proposal, that would be their responsibility to ask for funding. If you brought up different points, talking about researchers, whether locally or maybe internationally, as you're sort of coming back and realizing that there are not enough funding and not even positions. So your project, if I'm understanding right, is creating a platform where you bring different actors together to then provide capacity which in this case could be implementation science, as you're talking about. And then previously, maybe you had sort of proposed as opposed to the second, where you give them the tools and then you say, here, go and implement. Because at the second iteration, we realized very quickly that we were dealing with adults. And adults have only certain aspects they want to learn. Like you can't teach them how to do research. They most probably have learned that already. But the thing is, they could learn things along the way as you guide them. So some of the projects were actually being submitted for funding. Some, I think, have got some funding for their small projects as well. And others are being implemented in their own organizations. 
Okay. Yeah. And I like sort of just giving them the tools because they are different phases in their lives with different skill sets and they going out doing it. And so you provide the platform using other assistant platforms like Facebook and then sort of bring in different actors together to work with the scientists to ensure that they're able to implement their respective projects. So what happened to the money that you had gotten and everybody had moved on when you applied during the COVID time? Because the funding actually comes from the National Research Fund. So we have to say that we can't run the program. We can't run the project. So they give it to another research or research grant. But that's a learning really because it's so hard to get funding. And we were (laughs) so willing to give it up. The national funding was um, lack. There was insufficient for every research that needs to be funded. So they could easily put it to somebody else or give it to somebody else. And we were willing to give it because no one can work on the project at the point. I think you've already sort of gone into it. Um, The second question I was going to ask, which were some of the challenges um, you faced. And I think going into a bit more nuance, especially since the contest was in 2019 and then right after COVID was, you know, Another take that I want to have is, so you tell us about some of the challenges you face with regards to applying for funding and having people in different phases of their life having moved on. What about what came after with your second iteration, some challenges you faced and maybe even now, and also some lessons that you've learned so far with regards to implementing the project? Because unlike your digital mentor podcast, we are also like the brainchild of this contest, which is digital. I guess maybe the challenges you face will be more associated with like technological aspects and dissemination as opposed to like working in person with people. So one of the key challenges that we have, at least for GROW, was to really find a home. Lucky for me, the Philippine Society of Physicians working for public health took us in and they agreed to GROW. So we are firmly with them at the moment. So technically, it's it's something that I do with them. So now it has a home. That's the first key challenge that we had before. Second is there are issues with the social media platforms as well in terms of privacy and in terms of whether you believe the principles of big tech or the ethics of that. So it's also something that we actually discuss as a group or as individuals in the community on to what is the best platform to use. So currently we're using Moodle to place our lectures and everything that we have so that it's also be accessible to everybody. And key of the challenges, I think the third one would be because our participants are adults, it's so difficult to cater for everybody. Um, What I mean by that is they have different degrees and sometimes maturity in their research as well. So for me, at least as someone who actually guide them in it, is to really modify as well how to capacitate an individual digitally and being mature enough to accept that we're talking to an adult. And it's difficult because it's easier to do it, a workshop like that, in face-to-face sessions. Our main innovation during that time was to work with more mentors during sessions and we on breakout groups so that it becomes more of one mentor, one project kind of thing and so that it could work. And there's a more personalized touch to how to help them develop their projects as well. So in terms of bringing different parties to the table, how do you navigate that? Because I know it's a challenge, especially sort of working with people from different parts. But initially, you said you had started with people who are close to you. But now I'm guessing it's broader than people who are close to you, right? Yeah, so I think the best thing that happened to us was working with the PSPHP, the Philippine Society of Physician, Public Health Physicians, because they have one broader network and they have like an admin positions or admin people. So broadcasting it through their network and through their communications to their members and to whom they actually are connected with, increase our reach in terms of those who wish to join into the project. And then because I'm also a member of that, it's easier to also coordinate within experts in the society to join in. So in terms of coordinating, because there was structure within the society already, it was easier to do things and it wasn't me who was doing those things working with people who already have the resources you need to implement sort of what you need to implement. That's cool. So I guess now the focus on, and maybe it might change in the future, is working to equip practitioners and sort of different actors with different skill sets that they need, maybe in terms of like ensuring that they publish their work or implementing their own research or even applying for grants based on what we've talked about so far. So what has the impact of your project been so far? Have you measured it? And then I guess my second question is, what are your plans going forward? Our measures really were, one, if they actually created their own proposals. 
and what happened to those proposals. The second was the reach of how many participants or who were the participants that were, who finished the program or the project within each run. So in terms of the number of participants we actually had, five the first time, we went to 20. Who finished it, I think, if I remember right, because we wanted to publish this as an innovation as well, especially because what we found is also we reach more women who are with families, uh, not just single women, in this platform compared to just in a workshop or in you're doing it. And then we were in a pandemic, so... In essence, you have all the challenges not to be doing it, but you were able to do it. And then yeah. your targets were a group or a sector that usually are not reached by science workshops. That in itself was a victory for us. And then we had, I think, we started with five projects. The first iteration was just one project and we completed it. And then we had five projects. We have three completed ones. So three out of five. And they were mentored by Mentors from Asia. So that was also a tick for us so that we were able to network and connect with not just mentors from the Philippines, but also mentors from Asia, from TDR Asia. Because what we wanted to do as well was to strengthen their network. So the participants that we have work on a single project, like there are three or four in a project. We cannot recruit a lot of mentors at that point. So we needed to also, as I said, I wanted them to have a more personalized uh, input in their projects. So we settled to at least four or five projects that they would do. So if I remember right, there were three that were completed. And then we maintained. What we did was, because part of one of the outputs really of the GROW was a community of practice. So to maintain that community of practice, what we did was they could still contact us in case they have new projects. And I, I've been contacted by some of the participants, especially in the endeavors that they do in their work. That's also one thing that we wanted. That's why part of the target participants for GROW the second time around was to create a project that you actually do for work so that it makes sense to you while you're doing the workshop in itself. One of the residents from a university hospital was doing an IT project or they were assessing acceptability of an IT project during COVID. So the history was there's a long line usually from, from this public hospital and the hospital did like a digitalized versions of a queue. But the thing is, the question was, can everybody actually access that queue digitally? So they were able to fit, complete the proposal. And then if I'm right, they were looking for partnership in other stakeholders in the hospital for the project. That was the last yeah. update that I had. But one of the key things I do think in that is when you have an adult, you see there's a need and it's related to her. So you don't really need to motivate them a lot because they're motivated just to finish it because they need it. Yeah. And that's a good thing to build upon. And the only thing that you can do as a mentor at that point is just guide them. Because most of the time, I think it's not more of a technical that I can input, especially some of them are more research experience. But the thing is, in implementation, I just know more. But the only thing I can give you is a guidance. Maybe the outcome that to measure the best is acceptance of those people who are not receiving this or appropriateness to health workers and things like that. And that's what I focus more. And because... For the future of the project, we created iCare, improving communications and uh, reach for the project that we have. So this was a bud off of GROW, and so we call it iCare for Public Health. What we do is we place our videos from GROW in the Moodle because we wanted to improve reach that people get access to this more. And we build on the community of practice that we were trying to build from GROW 1 to GROW 2. So we wanted to create a more of a network, a flat hierarchy network where you can just place your questions. Again, on the idea that we are dealing with adult researchers that maybe I just don't know how to do startup. Maybe I just don't know how to use R. And there are technical experts in the society who does it. Maybe I just wanted to know how to do systematic reviews at the moment. And say, for me, I've done three or four systematic reviews. I can teach how to do it. These are some things that it's so hard to ask your professor, I guess. I think this is really cool. And you actually sort of answered the last question, kind of. Maybe if you want to add more concrete statements in terms of the sustainability of growth. 
For sustainability, our strategy really is to go digital on it because it's low cost and the infrastructure is there. And we have a society who's also working with us. So our main concept at the moment is to copy what GitHub does to to teach data science and data programming. Because I also benefited from that. Like you just pose a question, you get there, and somebody is an expert gets to answer it, and you move on with your life. And what we want to do in the Philippines is simply like that as well. Like, I don't know how to do a systematic review, so I can contact you. This is how the things are. This might be the literature that you might need to do. And then contact me when you begin and then move on with your life. But the thing is that move on with your life is actually a pay it forward. Somebody that you actually just given five minutes or 10 minutes of your time actually move on and create a publishable work that could impact the country. And that's what we wanted to do. It's a simple idea that just pays it forward every time. It's like a gift that keeps on giving. And a person like in the society where I belong it's the motto it's to share what you know they could earn from it maybe if they go for the funding and things like that and good and well but i do hope that they also teach people that are younger than us because in the philippines the key really is in building a critical mass of public health practitioner especially now especially during the pandemic where uh, public health experts become so important in a country like the Philippines it's very it's needed to be important because we need to make the work that we do for the pandemic and for public health and future pandemic more reasonable and practical I really sort of like how this is going. So I think your motto is going to work. But um, sort of recapping as we come to an end, I think you've given great approaches that people can think about in terms of not only creating spaces for connection, but also finding avenues that you can uplift voices, whether it's in publication spaces or just, as you said, the need for more public health experts, ensuring that we have sort of the safety net where we have scientists within our own respective countries who are able to do the research that is necessary, contextualize global level. And so some things that you talked about that I want to highlight are tapping into existing networks. So having NGOs, societies, practitioners, starting with your friends and then expanding outwards. Working with a vehicle that already has the administrative resources that you need so you don't have to do them. I think that was really cool because sometimes you think like you have to like reinvent the world when you, all you have to do is just tap into and connect to somebody who already have the resources. Creating some sort of systems approach where you have digital structure and then having people just come in less of consciousness and then ensuring that they have their questions in with regards to different aspects of implementation size or even other things, whether it's like mentoring or just be able to provide an answer and then there's a paid forward model that allows for everyone to contribute. <laughs> I think this is brilliant and a cool project. Is there anything you want to add? Any last final words as we um, conclude? Yeah, and I think that has been very crucial as well when we we were building is is to always keep it flat in terms of structure as much as possible to take away hierarchies in possessions because in an Asian culture that is a main barrier because people don't ask questions because they're too shy or too afraid so that's why we also like it being digital because you can go anonymous it could be a older person like a 50 year old researcher asking for someone who knows how to do systematic reviews and the one who answers is a 30 year old PhD student from somewhere so it takes away that hierarchy of a lot of things and it really does makes you feel one accountable for the things you say and accountable for the work that they did eventually because that's also the beauty of putting it in a society who has a reputation already because somebody is ensuring accountability to the things that are being said in discussion and keeping things in a manner acceptable to everybody that no one bullies another a science forum could also be a place where people can bully actually so that was a, yeah. something that we wanted to ensure as well yeah. that someone's monitoring it so monitoring yeah i think that's a good point to bring up monitoring and also ensuring that information that is provided is actually expert evaluated this is really cool so thank you ezra for joining us today i think it's really great to hear about your project and the different avenues you are tapping into ensuring that there's fairness there's a way to pay it forward and there's a way that everybody can feel comfortable sharing their challenges with regards to research and implementation of that and getting something out and then paying it for it. I think that's really cool. Thank you for joining us. I want to also thank our listeners for tuning in. Please follow us on Twitter at mental underscore podcast, where we'll let you know when our new episodes are released. 
You can listen to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud by searching your digital mentor podcast. You can also reach us by email. So please send your comments and questions to enquiries at your digimental.net. Again, enquiries at your digimental.net. As always, information on the episode and how to reach us will be in the description box, including how to connect with our guests and also links to more information and resources. Our goal is for this podcast to be shared as a resource. So please remember to tell people about us. Whether it's to find a mentor, be a mentor, or even start a mentoring program, there's no such thing as too many mentors. With that, I'd just like to say a huge thank you again for your support and hope you can join us for season three. This episode is supported by Advanced Courses and Scientific Conferences, a program which develops and delivers training and conferences that span basic research, cutting edge biomedicine and application of genomics in healthcare. Through engaging and networking, the events educate, inspire and transform careers worldwide. This episode is also supported by the Wellcome Sanger Institute. It undertakes large-scale research that forms the foundations of knowledge in biology and medicine. It uses the power of genome sequencing to understand and harness the information in DNA. The Sanger's discoveries are used to improve health and to understand life on Earth.